If you have your Bibles, what I'd like you to do is turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13, and we'll look at a couple verses this week. And let me put the caveat out there as we get into Revelation 13. We're getting now into some very deep issues in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is not for beginners. I just can tell you that. And I, I will put the caveat out there. If you're hanging with me, and you can absorb about maybe 10 to 20 percent of what I'm saying, then you're doing okay. That's all right. Because the book of Revelation is a very mature book. That's why very few churches or pastors will even attempt it, because it, go, it starts going over people's heads real quick. I'm trying to go as slow as I can, and the thing that John, and this is the, you have to know this going into this book, John simply expects us to understand everything he's saying. That's just the way he rolls. And he's like, how come you guys didn't read this in the Old Testament? It's all over the Old Testament. And so almost every verse that John alludes to is directly linked to an Old Testament passage and an Old Testament concept and an Old Testament meaning. That's where we derive all the meaning. So he, John almost anticipates that if you're going to study his book and you're going to unpack it, you've got to know your Old Testament very well in order to understand what he's alluding to. Because a lot of what he's saying is repeating what Old Testament prophets talked about, but he's condensing it and putting in actually in a systematic formula. He's the first prophet to lay things out chronologically in his book and see the whole thing lay out in a seven-year sequence. Knowing that, I just want to put that caveat because I'm going to spend several messages on Revelation 13. It starts getting deep quick. And so I'll, I'll go as slow as I need to, and we'll try to unpack it as best I can. The title of today's message is Discerning the Counterfeit. And we're going to look at Satan's ultimate counterfeit that he's going to foist on the, the entire world called the Antichrist. The Antichrist is talked about more times than any other figure other than the Messiah himself. He's all over the Old Testament in allusions. He's all over the New Testament, and he's definitely in our text today. And he is Satan's best and most masterful counterfeit he has ever perpetrated in human history. And we need to unpack that, take our time with it, and understand it. So we're in some deep stuff today. And so no apologies for that, but just understand, if you're not tracking with me, that's okay. It's okay. Get about 10% of what I can say, and then just keep adding to that knowledge. The Antichrist then perpetrates this counterfeit. And most people, when you talk about the Antichrist, they think of, well, the Antichrist is going to be this ugly-looking creature that's easy to identify. It's not that. And so people have some misconceptions of the Antichrist, and most people think he looks like pictures like this guy. And it's, okay, he's got a 666 on his forehead, and he's red and, and stuff like that. Or he looks like this one guy from uh, Tom Cruise's movie, Legend, or whatever I think it was back in the 80s. A lot of you young people didn't know what I'm talking about. So anyway, they think, well, that's, he's going to look like that, or he's going to look like the little guy, Mini-Me, from The Passion of the Christ, have hair on its back and, and just look like that. It's just weird. It was just, that's not how the Antichrist comes in that form. The Antichrist is not going to be that obvious. If you recall, there was a movie made in the 70s, and you remember uh, The Omen, The Omen 2, and The Omen 3, and whatever. Uh, when I was a little kid, I somehow watched it. I don't know. It freaked me out. And believe it or not, that movie came pretty close to understanding the concept of the Antichrist and that he will be born, he will grow up, and then take power. And that, that movie with, you know, the idea of Damien growing up as a little kid and, you know, then he goes to military school and then he becomes this world leader, that's actually pretty close. And, and so there's a lot of truth in that movie. Believe it or not, as growing up, that movie stayed in the back of my mind as a child because I, the Antichrist was foreign to me. I had no clue. I never heard of that growing up Catholic. I never heard of the Antichrist. Never, that never dawned on me. So it stayed in the back of my mind, and believe it or not, when I actually heard the gospel for the first time and I heard someone preaching through the book of Revelation, it was the passages on the Antichrist that woke me up out of my stupor. It was prophecy that woke me up, that got me saved. And believe it or not, I think God used those things to say, yeah, it's going to get real bad, and if you want to miss it, you need to accept my son. And, and I was scared into the kingdom, so to speak. I was scared into salvation, which a lot of people do get scared. Death can scare you, or prophecy can scare you, and that's actually a good thing. It's okay. 
But nonetheless, what we have to understand about the Antichrist, he will be a man who is born and grow up into this. But it's futile to try to pin the tail on the donkey, so to speak. And it's, it's futile to try to figure it out and try to figure him out. Is he possibly alive today? Yeah, it's very possible he's alive today. And we'll get some clues about the area where he's from today and things of that nature. But as time is developing and the world's getting to where it's at prophetically, he's eventually going to have to come on the scene at, at some point in time. So Satan has to grow him. Satan has to know. Satan has to get him prepped to... Because when he comes on the world scene, he's fully a mature man on the scene. So it's not like he's just created and then put on the scene. He has to grow into this. So there's a lot of things that are transpiring that we may not know that Satan is doing already. So it's very possible he is alive today and living somewhere and being groomed by Satan. A passage that talks about not trying to pin the tail on the donkey is from the Apostle Paul. I wanted to show you, and these are preliminary understandings, so... We want to lay some groundwork before we get into Revelation 13. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, that's the rapture, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So let me preface this a little bit. What the Thessalonians were dealing with were post-tribulational false teachers, giving them like... They were telling them, you're going to go through the tribulation, and you're going to go through all these hard times through the tribulation, what we're studying in the book of Revelation. Well, it freaked them out. And again, this was false teaching, and Paul had to go in there and correct it and say, no, 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 we're going to be removed before this time. So the first person that was teaching pre-tribulationalism was the apostle Paul. Nonetheless, he goes, let no one deceive you by any means for... And then it's not in the Greek, so it's italicized. That day will not come. It just says, for unless or since because the fallen away comes first, that the apostasy of the church, which is happening currently, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So he'll pretend to be God. That'll be the lie. Do you not remember when I was still with you, I told you these things? I find that very interesting. Paul told this to the Thessalonian church, and they were babes in Christ. And you know what the first things he was rolling out to them? Prophecy, which is the last thing churches are teaching today. I find that interesting. If the apostle Paul was here, he teaches fledgling churches prophecy. And he says, don't you remember what I told you? He was teaching them the tribulation, teaching them about the Antichrist. He was teaching them about all this stuff. So don't ever be afraid to tell a new believer about prophecy. Paul was telling them. So he has to remind them. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It is. Satan is working his plan to to bring it to fruition. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Well, I'm not going to completely parse this out because we don't have the time to parse the, the text out. The reference that Paul is talking about, he's saying, don't worry right now about this because the Holy Spirit, the He in the text, that's why it's capitalized, the He in the text is the Holy Spirit restraining through the church the Antichrist. Because if you go back to the original text, and only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out. Well, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. What do you mean by taken out? Well, because the context is dealing with the rapture, the church is removed. So a a lot of theologians will combine the removal of the restraint of the Holy Spirit with the removal of the church concurrently. And that's probably the best theological understanding of the text. Hence, as long as the church is here, the Antichrist is being restrained through the efforts of the Holy Spirit working through the church. Once the church is removed in the rapture, the Holy Spirit unrestrains the Antichrist, and then he is revealed. And so we have a good understanding. It's not good to start projecting out who could be the Antichrist because it doesn't matter. He's being restrained, which is a good thing for us 
I don't really want to see the Antichrist. I don't want to know who he is. I don't want to have to deal with him. So thank God we're going to be raptured, and then whoever's left behind is going to have to deal with him. But that's a little understanding of what's happening. But here's what we've got to come to grips with. Since he's restrained, and we can't pin the tail on the donkey, as good Bible students, what am I supposed to look for as Jesus talked about birth pains? about you will, you will know the signs of the times. See, I have told you beforehand. What are we to be looking for? Ah, this is key. You are not to be looking for the Antichrist per se. You are to be looking for his government. His government, according to Scripture, forms first before he's on the scene before he takes over his government. So the mystery of lawlessness is already at work forming his government. And the other word we use in common vernacular is a one-world government. The one-world government is forming. So you and I as Bible students should be looking at the forming of a one-world society, a one-world government. Now, it's kind of the idea, and if you want to keep this concept in mind, so instead of looking for the Antichrist, trying to pin the tail on the donkey, you look for the government. It's the same concept as looking for Christmas by knowing Thanksgiving's ahead of it, if that makes sense. So you know Christmas is close when Thanksgiving is around you. And by the way, there's kind of a fight right now among holidays. I don't know if you realize this. The turkey people are fighting the Christmas people, and they're wanting people to respect the turkey because people are blowing right over Thanksgiving and going to Christmas. I am guilty of that. This last year, I set up Christmas lights before Thanksgiving. And we set up all the decorations before Thanksgiving, so I'm guilty of doing that. But what's the point? The point is, you know that Christmas is close when you're celebrating Thanksgiving, right? You know it's around the corner. It's the same way with the Antichrist. If I'm seeing the formation of a one-world government form right in front of my very eyes and people wanting it and desiring it, ah, then I know the Antichrist is not far behind. You see the concept? You look for the, the preliminary first. And so that's what even the, our text will talk about today. So let's go to Revelation verse 1, chapter 13, and start unpacking just a little bit today. And it says this, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. The sea is a reference to the Mediterranean, okay? Because Israel's next to the Mediterranean. Any reference to the sea is always a reference to the Mediterranean, typically. Singular. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, obviously Satan, gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Let's stop right there. Keep that up there for me. Let's unpack this just a tiny bit. Already, John is trying to say, before he introduces the man of sin, he introduces the government. You see the, the order? He wants you to understand that it's the government you need to pay attention to first. So he introduces the government. And this is a reference to his government and what he's like. The origin of the Antichrist is, is hinted at a little bit in this. The idea of standing on the sand of the sea is a picture of John standing on the, the seashore of Israel because Israel would face the Mediterranean. So you can imagine John standing on the coastline of Israel and looking westward into the Mediterranean is the idea. The idea of the sea and the Mediterranean and all that, symbolic in the sea was chaos, Symbolic in the sea is where Leviathan was at, the ancient sea monsters. Israel looked at the sea differently than you and I do. We go to Pismo, and we go to Avila, and we look at the ocean, we look at the sunset, and we say, oh, how beautiful that is. That's just so wonderful that it, we can see a sunset, and the ocean looks so pretty. To the Jew, it's not like that. Because to Jewish people who knew the Bible very well, the seas represented the flood and judgment the seas represented chaos because we can't live there. It is a place of unknown. It's a place of chaos because in that day, they put a boat on the water. It could easily sink, and they were very much afraid of the water. It was not a place 
where we could abide as human beings. And so it was connected to Leviathan, which is another name for Satan. It was connected to chaos. It was connected, one more time, to Gentiles. The oceans, where all the chaos was, represented the Gentiles. So you only had two classes of people, according to the Old Testament Scripture, Jew and Gentile. Okay? So when you're looking at this text, it's very Jewish, and it's giving you a hint of the Antichrist origins. If he's coming out of the sea, which represents chaos, Leviathan, Satan, but also Gentiles, ah, this matches with Daniel chapter 9, which talks about the Antichrist coming specifically from the people who destroyed the temple in 70 AD. And who were they? Romans, the Roman government. So now we're on to something. We definitely know his origins are Gentile. He is a Gentile. He is not Jewish. He is a Gentile. But notice it's the sea. It's not the Atlantic Sea. It's not the Indian Sea. It's not the Pacific Ocean or anything like that. It's directly referring to the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean region. So you couple that with other passages in the Old Testament about where he comes from. Well, according to Daniel, the Antichrist comes out of the fourth kingdom, which is the Roman Empire. Rome is still with us, and I've mentioned this before. You just don't see Rome's imperial power right now. She's still with us, and she has centered in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. But nonetheless, if you recall, what did Rome control in Jesus' day? They controlled all of the Mediterranean. They controlled Western and Eastern Europe, they controlled the Middle East, and they controlled North Africa. So if you have that region in mind, and then now you're zeroing in with this text, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, it is telling you where he comes from. He comes from that region of the world, either Western, Eastern, Middle East, or North Africa. He comes from that region, but it's a Mediterranean region where he comes from. Hence, that eliminates a lot of people trying to pin the tail on the donkey because if they say, hey, it's Hillary Clinton, hey, it's Obama, they're wrong because they have the wrong region. He's not going to come from America. He's not coming from Canada. He's not coming from Central America. He's not coming from Antarctica or Australia. He's not coming from China. He will come from that region of the world where the Roman government was and where the Mediterranean was or is, I should say. And so that's, that's a clue here in the text of where he comes out of. Now, in verse 2, now you're getting into the government. And I want to unpack this. And notice how the idea of he's a beast that has all kinds of parts of animals. Well, John's expecting you and I to understand that those animals are a reference to Daniel chapter 7. And so let's read Daniel chapter 7. After this, and then again, this is the visions that Daniel is getting many, many hundreds of years before John. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. This fourth beast is the Antichrist government. We know it as Rome, okay? Dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. What do you mean? Well, what Daniel did, and John, again, expects us to understand this, he tries to say, look, it's a conglomeration of the previous empires that were named who would control Israel. See, Israel's theocracy ended in 596 B.C. when the Babylonians took Israel into captivity. At that point, the Shekinah glory left the temple and departed, and Israel went into captivity for 70 years. At that point, Daniel is given the vision that from this point until the coming of Messiah, Israel will be under the guise or under the control of Gentile powers until Messiah ends it. And this included Messiah's first coming and second coming. Okay? So God predicted and told Israel, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be four successive empires that control you until my son, or basically the Messiah, destroys these Gentile empires. We went through some of them already in history. Let me show you some of these pictures. The first one that was predicted was Babylon. 
And that was currently what was going on in the Babylonian captivity, that Babylon would keep control of Israel during their time. This was controlled for several hundreds of years, and it was symbolized by a lion with wings. It was symbolizing of Nebuchadnezzar. And then he says a, a second empire would come, and he, he put an animal to it, and it was a bear with three ribs in its mouth and lifted on its side. The bear symbolized Medo-Persia. It was a combination of Persia and the Midian Empire that had come together. It was very powerful, not as glorious as the previous empire, but it ruled over Israel at that time. This is where, uh, when Persia was in charge, this is where the story of Esther comes out of. And it was out of Persia that Cyrus allowed Israel to come back and rebuild their walls and temples in Jerusalem. Then a third empire was predicted. This empire was symbolized by a leopard with four wings, and this leopard was very fast. It was the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, and then it broke up into four pieces. That's why you see the four heads there, because once Alexander the Great died, and I think he died when, 30, he, died when he was 33 years old, his empire split up into four pieces with his four generals. And that's why you get the four heads, the four wings, and stuff like that. And, and it was a very quick empire. It's very fast. So then what John is saying and what Daniel is saying, that I saw a beast, and this beast is a conglomeration of the previous empires, but it has parts of the other empires in it. But because it has all these different parts, he can't name the animal. He says it's just a beast. It's some type of animal. That's why it's called the beast government. And then Daniel notes this, and it had ten horns. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms. So it has these horns, and let me show you another picture. So this is kind of the conglomeration of the animals put together, but notice the ten horns. The ten horns are projecting into the future of the final development of the Roman Empire. What will happen as Rome continues... It will, it will merge into a one-world government, which we're seeing form today. And then it will break up into ten different sectors that control the one-world government. And it will be ruled by ten kings, ten world leaders who will rule the entire planet. This is before the Antichrist comes on the scene, by the way. So the horns are always a symbol of power, always a symbol of kingship. And so that's why the beast has ten horns, because eventually the one world government will break up into a ten league confederation of the world. Let me show you another picture. Not to confuse you anymore, if you're already confused, but this coincides with Daniel chapter 2. Now, this is a second confirmation of these four Gentile empires, but it's called Daniel's metallic man in Daniel chapter 2. Now, Hold on with me or I'll lose you like a wet bar of soap in a shower. Daniel also saw another vision. This is prior to the animal vision, but it, it basically confirmed the same thing he saw. Instead of seeing animals, he saw it on a metallic man. And again, just to run through this real quick, he saw the, this metallic man. The head of gold was Babylon. Then the, the chest was Medo-Persia. Grecian Empire was the torso. And then it you know, divided stage with Alexander the Great. And then it went into the Roman beast empire. You had a united stage at the time of Jesus. And then we're right now currently in the two-stage division, as you can see the legs. Western Europe, Eastern Europe. That's where it's located today. Then eventually it forms into a one-world government stage, and then a ten-division stage symbolized by the ten toes, and then eventually merges into the Antichrist stage, with eventually Messiah's kingdom coming and destroying it out of heaven, symbolized by the mountain cut out without human hands. So that's a picture of the government. So what we're looking for right now is the formation of a one world government. And do we see that today? You betcha. The key to understand the return of Rome, if you want to call it a return, it's never really went away. It's always been here. What you haven't seen is one distinctive that John and Daniel are both pointing out. He's, he says it's different than the previous empires. It's very different. And I can tell you why it's different. One thing, imperialism. Imperialism. You must understand this concept to understand what's going on in the world right now. Okay? 
the definition from Webster's Dictionary, the policy or practice or advocacy of extending the power and dominion of a nation, especially by direct territorial acquisitions or by gaining indirect control over the political or economic life of other areas. What it means is that the ones who have the power will start trying to control other nations. That's how globalism works. A foreign body will tell a national sovereignty country what to do. Did we see imperialism in Jesus' day? Absolutely. It's all over the Gospels. You must identify it. What do you mean? Who was running Israel at the time of Jesus? Pontius Pilate. He was a foreigner put in the location to run the country and to keep it down. And Roman garrisons were there and soldiers were there to keep rebellion from happening. That was extremely different than any other nation in history has ever done. Because you know what the typical thing that Babylon or Media Persia or Greece even did under Alexander the Great? What they did was they drew up nationals to run the country. Nationals from the country to do it. They didn't put their own foreigners into it. That was very different. That's what John says and Daniel says. It's different. It's different than any other previous empire. It's different. Now, here's the question. Do we see imperialism starting to happen today? You better believe you do. You are seeing the return of Rome's imperialism. When you have the UN telling countries like us what to do, that's imperialism. They're trying their best to do it. Thank God that Trump is opposing all that nonsense. But it's something like the Paris Peace Accords, where we're going to give millions of dollars to a fake climate warming summit meeting or, or global entity of the UN, give them millions of dollars so they can redistribute our wealth to other countries, which is a form of Marxism. That's called imperialism. This whole stupid carbon tax thing where you can't run your air a certain degree, or you can't run your SUV, it's fake. It doesn't exist. It's a joke. They have no evidence before it, but why are they doing it? They want a taxation system that goes beyond our borders that you and I never voted for, and to eventually be taxed by some global entity like the UN. The UN is already trying to enforce treaties on us, right, as you can speak. But we have resisted. We're the last man standing. It's the United States. That's why they hate Trump. Because he's, he's going against imperialism. He's going against globalism. You have to understand where the fight's at. It's not that we think Trump is some pure pastoral type of person. He's got a checkered past. We know that. But at least he's stopping globalism. You've got to give him credit for that. But at the same time, the forces of darkness are working all over the world to get people to buy into globalism. Or they'll call it internationalism, or whatever you want to call it. That's the formation of the one world government. And they will eventually, as they're doing now in other countries, telling other countries what to do. And they're not respecting their sovereignty. Ask yourself this question. It's a simple question. How does God feel towards a one world government? All I got to do is read Genesis. All I got to do is see it when it happened the first time at the Tower of Babel. We're under Nimrod, an antichrist type of figure who is conglomerating all the world's power and money under him and all religions under him. How did God feel about that? He went down and confused the languages and spread them out into what? individual nation states, language, culture, borders. That's what God wants. The application you and I can take is we are to resist globalism. We are to resist people telling us we need to do the UN's bidding and do what their treaties want. If it was up to the UN, you and I would lose our free speech just like that. You would lose your Second Amendment just like that, according to the UN. They want that all gone. They hate our Constitution. Absolutely despise it because it prevents globalism from here. 
prevents them trying to get into our lives. Scary, because the left is pushing this. That's the whole difference. Let's go back to Daniel's text. But is it going to stop? No. And shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces, the ten, actually ten pieces. We're not going to be able to stop it. Daniel's predicting it shall devour the whole world. The whole world will go here. I don't know what happens with poor Trump. I don't know. I don't know after the next, next election what happens. you got all these Marxists and socialists and communists in our country. They're going to vote for a guy like Bernie Sanders or any other globalist the left can put up there. I feel sorry for what's happening. We've seen our last conservative or traditional election go bye-bye. It's over. we got too many millennials that are leftists. They'll outvote us at, at some point in time. And you're like, well, why are you getting political? Because... We're dealing with a geopolitical issue. Christianity is way beyond just your personal walk with the Lord. People have sold you a lie. And let me tell you what the lie, it's a partial lie. What people have told you in America is that Christianity just involves you and Jesus and that's it. Nothing beyond that. You know why? They've kept prophecy from you. Because when you get into the world of prophecy, all of a sudden you step out of, your, out of yourself, out of your box, and into a whole new geopolitical world. And you're thinking, this is way bigger than I thought. It sure is. Christianity is not simply about your personal walk with Jesus. Even though it includes it, that's only one spoke of the wheel. What's happening is Bible-believing prophecy incorporates Israel, the Middle East, politics, worldview, other things beyond the scope of what you typically hear in sermons. That's why people accuse me of being political. And I'm not. I'm just telling you, this is where it's going. This is what God is trying to say, warn us about, and no one's paying attention about it. Now, I'm speaking to the choir, and you already know this, but go outside of our church and talk to someone going to a feel-good church and ask them, hey, what do you think about the geopolitical situation in the Middle East? Ask them that. And you know what you're going to get? A calf at a new gate. You know, have you ever seen a calf at a new gate? Didn't know what to do with the gate. He just looks at it. You guess what you're going to get? Because the pastors have lullabied people to sleep. Oh, it's just about you and Jesus. It's beyond that. It's about the angelic conflict. It's about Satan's attack on God. It's about Israel and her promises that God made to her. It's, it is about the church. It's about the great apostasy. It's, it's so much more than just our personal walk. It incorporates so much more, and we have to know that. Interesting enough, let me show you this picture. If you don't think I'm making this up, this is, this is real stuff. I, I mean, you, if you think, well, you're crazy. Why did the UN build and model their UN building after the Tower of Babel? No joke. This is not like I made this up. They said that. They modeled it off the Tower of Babel because what did they want? A one world government, which what Nimrod tried to do, yeah? That's exactly what they're aiming for. They think this is greatest thing since sliced bread. And if we could just get that, we can reach utopia and we reach nirvana. Oh, you're trying to have a kingdom without the king, huh? I see what you're doing. Not going to work. But honestly, this is what they patterned it off of. Let me show you this other picture. You think I'm joking? Look, this is their own propaganda. Europe, many tongues, one voice. Very communistic types of pictures and stuff like that. Many tongues, one voice. Wait, wait, w w one voice. One language are you talking about? Oh, that's Tower of Babel language. They spoke one language at Tower of Babel, and then God confused the languages. Notice how they're using the same phraseology and maybe probably don't even know it. That's bizarre. They're using the same biblical language, but in, for them it's a positive thing? <gasps> Yikes. Let me show you this other passage, just more preliminary so you understand. First Thessalonians, Paul's talking to the Thessalonians who were being told that there's a post-millennial rapture and you're going to go through the tribulation. He says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. For when they say, or it can be translated, peace and security, 
Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. What is he referring to? The tribulation, the revealing of the Antichrist, the pounding of the judgments of the tribulation. But notice what he says. When you hear them say a phrase over and over again, wake up. Do you think they know they're saying biblical words of prophecy? I don't think Obama has a clue. I don't think Tony Blair has a clue what they're saying is exactly what Paul told Timothy they would say at the end. Peace and security, peace and safety. It's the same thing. Oh, my land. They're quoting Scripture, and they don't know it. And sudden destruction is going to come upon this world because of that. Let's do a little bit more drilling down, if you'll hang with me, because I want to show you how specifically this is being done currently right now as we speak. And this is where I drill down. This is where I might lose you. That's okay. If you need to take a nap or something, go ahead. That's all right. But at some point, you're going to have to know how the game is being played. You're going to have to know what's happening. I'm going to tell you the three areas they're hitting before we get into this. There are three major areas the leftists or globalists are hitting currently as we speak. If you're not aware of this, you need to get up to speed. Number one, the entertainment industry, including Hollywood, the music industry, and I would include the media in the entertainment industry. Those areas under that rubric of entertainment, and that would include news, is being hijacked by globalist leftists. Every movie has some leftist political theme. Every one of them. You can't go to the movies anymore and just watch a nice story without some goofball putting something into the movie. Like, for instance... I went and watched Spider-Man. This is a year or two ago with my kids. There's an insert, and they're at the Washington Monument, and the little girl in the movie says, yeah, this was all built by slaves. That white privilege thing. Attack on the founders. Dismantle the Constitution. And I thought, I'm watching Spider-Man. Can you leftists just stop? Can you just stop? You had to put it in Spider-Man. And the, the, the girls making remarks about, yeah, all of the found, basically the attack on the founders, they're all slaveholders, right? You've heard that story, right? That's the talking point. They can't let it go. Entertainment industry or Hollywood media, whatever. Politics, you know that already. Why do the Republicans do anything? Because they're, they're just the same. There's, no, there's one party. There's not two. There's one party. That's it. So politics has been corrupted. The last one's education. K through 12 is a nightmare in the United States. It is an absolute nightmare in the public schools. If you're a public school teacher, God bless you, because you're in for a roller coaster ride coming up. They're going to push things on you that you never thought they're going to push. College and universities. You want your kid brainwashed? Go ahead and send them to college. They'll come out a raging Marxist atheist. They'll challenge everything you've taught them. They'll undermine everything. I'm all for education, but you bet, if you're on, I'm going to spend $50,000 on a kid going to college, I ain't spending $50,000 to get brainwashed. I'm not doing that. They came out with the top colleges or whatever just this last week. Some of these schools had zero conservative professors, zero, all leftists, Marxists, communists. I'm going to have my kid there sitting there under a communist teacher giving him propaganda, and don't think it's not happening in the high schools. It is. We got instances of this all over the place. What's the goal? Okay, let me show you real quick. The first thing is, you have to attack anti-globalism with their pseudo agenda. So globalism is the ultimate goal of glo- uh, globalism is the eventual unification of humanity under a one-world government. Okay, the first thing how it's done and it's achieved is what they say and what they really mean. The first thing they say is, well, we, we want to. Uh, it's economic. We want to benefit the poor. Promote income equality. Income equality? That's Marxism. And in protectionism. Oh, they call us being, when we say America first, oh, that's protectionism. No, we're looking at our own people. We're taking, trying to take care. Let me ask you this. Is it protectionism that you lock your doors at night? Oh, that's protectionism. You shouldn't even lock your door. Let anyone walk in your house. 
That's mean that you don't let anybody camp out in your backyard. How dare you? That's racist. You should let anyone camp out on your backyard. You see how they get at you? The real issue is what? What are they trying to attack when they, when they go after this? Next. Redistribute the wealth. Destroy capitalism. Progressive income tax. Overtaxation. Overregulation. It's getting harder and harder to live in California. You know what? That's intentional. It's not an accident. But that's what they're trying to do is to the economy is destroy capitalism, destroy the free market. Go back to number two, political equality, erase borders, open borders. You've heard these mantras, right? What is this trying to attack? What are they going after? What it really is is to destroy the West by taking away self-governance and national sovereignty because they're moving to globalism. That's what that all is about. Open borders is about destroying national borders. Number three on what they say, social equality, human positive rights, rid the society of oppression, multiculturalism. Notice the term positive rights. They make up rights. You have a right to health care, they'll say. You have a right to die. You have a right to this. You have a right to that. It's all called positive rights. Someone has determined what those rights are, like Obama or somebody like that. You have a right to health care. Where in the Ten Commandments does it say, I have a right to health care? I'm not serious. If you notice, the Ten Commandments are inalienable rights. They're in the negative form. It's stuff that, that only can be taken away from you because they're given to you by God. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Those are things that you take away from the individual. Positive rights is something you give. But who's going to give it? The government. What is it an attack on? What, they, what the reality is on number three? Through cultural Marxism, remove inalienable rights, destroy America's constitution, destroy the Judeo-Christian morality, destroy true Christianity, destroy the family, destroy marriage, destroy gender roles. That's what it's about. See, you and I have a right to marry if we do it right. But now they say, no, you know, you got to let the guy marry his horse. You know, if he wants to marry his horse, you ought to be, he ought to have a right to marry his horse. How dare you say he can't marry his horse? Yeah, but the horses, they have civil unions and stuff, man. What are you talking about? They have the same rights? What are you talking about, man? See, the thing is, they have to take something from you and I and give it to people that don't have the right. You and I pay taxes, a lot of them. Is it right that we fund people who don't? Thank you. Let's go to the last one, four. What they say, and it's all pseudo-morality, by the way. We're only doing this for security reasons. That's why we're tracking you on Google and Facebook and all your social media. That's why we, we track you on your phone. We just want to know where people are at. We just want to know, you know, we're, we're, we're afraid of terrorists. Really, if you're really afraid of terrorists, why don't you do something about Islam? But they're not going to. But what we're saying is, you know, we've we got to know where everyone's at. You know, like China putting up thousands and thousands of cameras to watch what their people are doing. Because it's security. And people are willing to give up their freedoms for security. So what it really is saying, the reality of, is destroying the uh, freedom, our freedom, destroy the ability for the populace to arm themselves, protect themselves, destroy freedom to associate, destroy the freedom of speech. That's what it's all intended to do. I know that seems pretty deep and stuff, but that's okay. I, I want to show you what they're up to with their pseudo-morals versus the reality of things. What's the reality of things? We're going to take away America's constitution. We're going to take away the American right, and we're going to get them on the fast track to globalism like the rest of the world. Look at Europe. They're gone. They are gone as a country. All those little countries are gone because they have allowed globalism to take over their world. This destroyed everything. Destroyed. If you go to these places in like France or England, it's not the same anymore. It's not merry old England. It's Londonistan. You go from six mosques to 600 mosques. You go to a mayor who's Islam. Oh, that's racist. I can't believe you. Yeah, he's the same guy that's outlawing knives because he keeps having knives attacks. He's already outlawed guns. He's trying to get his populace unarmed because in the global government, you've got to have a populace that's unarmed. It's a lot here, and I don't, I, I don't want to belabor this, so I, I'm going to move to an application, and we'll stop here. What's the application? Deception. It's all about deception. And they're trying to deceive you and I by pseudo-morals. 
that are not morals from the Bible, not morals from God, but morals that they created. Like tolerance. Find that in the Bible. Find their concept of tolerance that I have to tolerate every deviant lifestyle that anyone could dream up and find that in the Bible. You'll find the opposite. And yet you and I will be called a hater and a bigot and a racist and a xenophobic and all that stuff. And you just got to take it on the chin. But how do we prevent the deception? How do we prevent the deception in our own lives if this is being perpetrated on us? Well, the first thing you have to come clean with is this. Deception starts with me. What do you mean? See, in order to have someone from the outside deceive me, I have to be willing to deceive myself. That's how the game is played. And I want to show you this just real quick and we wrap up. We're not here for the Antichrist, obviously. But many Antichrists, smaller Antichrists, are running the game, so to speak, and getting the world to that place to eventually he's ushered on the scene by Satan. So there's a lot of people in the world doing very evil and corrupt things. And yet people are suckered by them. It's like you, they've painted sucker right across people's foreheads and like, that guy sounds great. And it's just like they're suckers, man. How does that happen? Self-deception. If you're going to be deceived by someone like the Antichrist, it means it first started with you. What do you mean? We all possess the sin nature. Everybody's aware of that. We're not born good. We're born with a sin nature that has a propensity to lean us towards Self-deception. We tell lies to ourselves. How we think we are. How we think reality is. How we want the world to go. And we lie to ourselves. And we lie. And we lie. And then you know what? After a while, you keep lying to yourself. You start lying to other people. It's called fronting. And you start lying to other people. And you give a good front. We all do it. And then you know what happens when we lie to ourselves and we start lying to other people then we're susceptible for someone deceiving us about reality. So to prevent yourself from being deceived, you have to work with yourself. You have to start telling the truth about yourself. What do you mean? I'm honest with myself. Look, we're not. We are not honest with ourselves. That is a major point of sanctification is to start getting into reality and into the truth of God's word so we can get out of our self-deception. We are living sometimes in a fantasy world, in a make-believe world, because it, it's, it, reality is too harsh for us. It, the fall has happened, and we don't want to acknowledge the fall. So what do we do? We create an environment where we lie to ourselves. I'm not so bad. I know I drink a little bit, but man, I'm not an alcoholic. Are you? Or are you just telling yourself that? Ah, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't eat so much. My overeating is no big deal. Everybody overeats a little bit. Really? My withdrawing from people's not so bad. I just don't like big crowds. Really? My codependency is not that big of a deal. Everyone does it, do they? Do, does everyone enable people what you're doing? My past had no effect on me, Brandon, whatsoever. Even though I went through multiple traumas, my past has nothing to do with what I'm doing right now. The drugs I'm taking, that's not bad, you know. I just do a little bit recreationally, and, and uh, I, I just, you know, it makes me feel better about life. Really? You're not an addict? The sex addiction that I have, Brad, it's no big deal. Everyone's looking at porn, it's, it's no big deal. Really? Really? See, when you start talking to yourself like that, you start playing a game of deception with yourself. And you're setting yourself up to be deceived. Until you come clean with yourself, hey man, I gotta stop the drinking, dude. I gotta stop the drugs. I gotta stop the porn addiction. I've gotta stop this. Whatever it is, your fair game for the spirit of Antichrist, which is happening all through the church. 
The way the game is played spiritually, the truth sets you free, does it not? But you must be truthful with yourself. That's how the game's played.